time. I'm sure you've heard this. This is the argument that only time can solve the problem of racial injustice. Only time can bring integration into being. Just be nice and just be patient and and wait a hundred or two hundred years and the problem will work itself out. And I think that is an answer to that myth. And that is that time is neutral. It can be used either constructively or destructively. And I'm absolutely convinced that in so many instances the forces of ill will in our nation, the extreme righteous of our nation, have used time much more effectively than the forces of goodwill. And it may well be that we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the vitriolic words and the violent actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence and indifference of the good people who sit around and say, wait on time. Somewhere we must come to see that human progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability comes through the tireless efforts and the persistent work of dedicated individuals who are willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the primitive forces of social stagnation. And so it is necessary to help time and to realize that the time is always ripe to do right. With this faith, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the word the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Well, hey, everyone, welcome to church. Scott and Mark here, and we're so glad that you're with us. As we are remembering Dr. Martin Luther King this weekend, we want to celebrate that we are uh, all created with dignity and worth, and we're finding that in Genesis. We're doing this series called You Were Made For This. Uh, Great message coming up, but before that, let's go ahead and jump into some worship.
We hope that you enjoyed that time of worship and we want to welcome you to this online church community. Uh, we here at Menlo Church exist to help you find and follow Jesus and also to live into meaningful purpose and connection and meaning. And a great way to do that, Scott, we believe is to help with our online church. You could serve with us online. And I don't know about you, Scott, some of my resolutions this year are to have more fun, meet more people, do more things that are, I don't know, valuable. And we feel like serving with our online church is a great way to do all of that. So if you're like me and those are some of your resolutions, we'd love to have you join us. It's really fun. All you have to do is to click the link in the chat or text serve to the number that's popping up on the screen now. And we'd love to help you and have you join our team. Yeah, serving is a great way to get connected and to find purpose. So yeah. we hope you do that. I don't know about you, but um, sometimes uh, I have questions about faith. Um, I wonder about things and um, I know a lot of us do. It's very sure. natural, normal. And if that's if that's you, um, you're not alone. Uh, lots of people have questions about what they believe, whether you're uh, someone who's followed Jesus for a long time, or maybe you're new to Christianity, or even just checking it out. Uh, we have something called Alpha, which is a wonderful place where you can learn, ask any question that you want. We say everybody's welcome here. Whatever your questions are, you can be you. And so it's a safe place to ask all your questions and to get real answers. And so maybe that's for you. Maybe that's for somebody you know. It's I know we all know lots of people that have questions about faith and Christianity. So if that's you, um, you can sign up online. It starts February 2nd. Don't miss this opportunity. It's all online. It's going to be a really helpful thing for you. Yes, and this is all made possible by your continued giving. So thank you very much for that. We can do things like Alpha or serve with us online because of your giving. And uh, we also have a prayer number that you can text. It's gonna pop up on the screen now that you can text at any time and receive prayer from a pastor on staff. And again, this is all because of your faithful giving. So thank you very much for that. Giving is very easy. All you have to do is follow one of the directions on the screen. And again, thank you so much. Yeah, we love to pray uh, for our congregation. We love to pray for you. And so take advantage of that. 
Well, as we mentioned earlier, we're jumping into week two of our series, You Are Made For This. And if you've ever wondered whether you have purpose, whether you have dignity, whether you have worth, whether you matter, today's sermon is for you. Let's take a listen to Laura Crosby as she presents for us. You were made by God. A reflection of His very image. Created with intention for meaningful work that blesses others. For life-giving rest. And significant relationships. It's in your DNA, the blueprint for your soul. Hi, I'm Laura Crosby, in case we're not friends yet. It's nice to meet you. Um, Remember when you were in school back in the day and would come back after break and sometimes there would be a pop quiz. Well, I was a teacher in another life and I would never do that. But this morning, well, I wanna start with a little quiz. We're gonna show a picture on the screen and I want you to guess who this person's parent is. Uh, If you are here live, just call it out. But if you are online, Get your fingers ready, because I want you to type the answer into the chat, all right? So here's the first picture. Whose parent, whose child is this? Who's the parent here? Do you guess Tom Hanks? All right. All right, and what about this one? Anybody recognize who this person's parent is? An oldie, yep. Good, Donald Sutherland, all right. And the third one, um, anybody recognize this guy, who this person's parent is? Think athlete, Um, get it? David Beckham. If you got all three right, great. There is absolutely no prize, (laughs) sorry about that. This morning, we are talking about just two verses in Genesis 1, where it says we bear the image of our Heavenly Father, the Imago Dei. I am so excited to preach on this because the implications are super important and so relevant to all of us. Not only do these verses have the potential to quiet those deep insecurities and the self-hate that many of us struggle with, but they also show us the cure for healing our world's greatest sicknesses, including racial strife, which is particularly relevant, right, on this MLK weekend. This truth can literally change the world. So let's dive in. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, to put this in context, throughout Genesis 1, 3 to 25, God says, let there be, let there be, let there be. And then in verse 26, he says, let us create mankind in our image. Now, one theory is that God is speaking to this divine council of spirits and angels. But the orthodox view is that the triune God is making mankind in his image. Us is referring to the three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, Jesus, and Holy Spirit. We are different than and of greater value than anything else in all creation. Now, this is kind of weird to think of being made in the image of God, because it's natural for us to think of image as a physical likeness. Kids often bear a physical resemblance to their parents, like we saw in the quiz, right? 
that we are made in the image of God does not mean that we physically look like him, but we do in spiritual essence have his DNA. He is spirit and we, in addition to being physical beings, are spiritual beings. Our spirits are immortal and will outlast our earthly bodies. We're intellectual. We can think, reason, solve problems. We're relational. We can give and receive love. And we have a moral consciousness. We can discern right from wrong. And then we make choices. Our choices make us both like God and accountable to God. Peter Enns wrote this. Many scholars draw a parallel between the image of God in Genesis and the images of kings in the ancient world. Rulers could not be everywhere at once and travel was slow. So they would erect monuments or statues of themselves throughout their kingdoms. These images let everyone know that the king's rule or influence extended wherever his image was found. Kind of like presidents now put their picture in post offices, right? God wants us to be his kingdom representatives throughout the world. In ancient Mesopotamian culture, only kings were made in the image of a powerful God, only kings. Peasants were actually thought to be made by inferior gods. So when the writer of Genesis says we're all made in God's image, he's challenging this belief. John Ortberg, wrote this, this is the single most world-changing truth about human dignity and equality ever recorded. Not just kings, but every human being was made in the divine image, the imago dei. So what are the implications for us? I wanna talk about three crucial implications and one challenge. The first implication regards our relationship with God and self. We are made to be in relationship with God for all of eternity. That is amazing. We can talk to the creator of the universe. He speaks to us through his word. In the Bible and through his Holy Spirit, he delights in us. We are different than all else that God created. Now, we took care of our daughter and son-in-law's dog over Christmas. Here's a picture of Coach. And he's really a great dog but he would get super anxious and start barking every night about eight o'clock. Now, what could he do about it? He couldn't talk to God about it. Dogs can't take their anxiety to God. They don't seek God and God doesn't seek them. Humans seek the Lord. The Lord seeks humans. The verse says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. This also impacts our self-image. No matter who you are, where you're from, or what you've done, every human being reflects the image of God. You are so valuable and so loved. Tim Keller writes this, there is a rock solid, irreducible objective glory and significance and value about you and everyone. Because of the doctrine of the image of God, God doesn't make junk, you are valuable. It's kind of like a parent carries pictures in, of his kids in his wallet, or more likely would be someone carrying pi a picture of their kids on their screensaver. Like your God's screensaver. God says, I have called you by name. You're mine. I delight in you. You're valuable. You're made in my image. In Job, it says, I have carved your name on the palms of my hands. So that's the first implication, our relationship with God and ourself. And then the second is our relationship with others, our, the view of others that we might come into contact with. The Imago Dei gives us a theology of dignity. The fact that you were made in the image of God tells you not just about your worth, but also the worth of others. We're made in God's image, but so is everyone else. It's our job not to see others as an alcoholic, or an immigrant, or a homeless person, or an anti-vaxxer, but to see them as someone made in the image of God with inherent worth and great possibility. It's your job to call out the image of God within others. As Joel Smitgall says, to dust off the image that is underneath the surface and call into existence and bring about possibilities in those who God has put in your path. 
A theology of dignity is also a theology of love. Now, I haven't seen anyone live this out better than my mentor, Coke Evans. She was the wife of the senior pastor we served with in Washington, D.C. 35 years ago. And with me, I carry in my head three kind of virtual snapshots. They were memories of ways that she interacted with people made in the image of God. The first image that I carry with, with me is of her at a party. We were at this huge party. It was at a mansion. I was away from my tiny kids for the first time in a long time, and I was having a blast. We went through this buffet line. I got something to eat, and I, we had, everybody had spread throughout the house to eat. And so I was walking with my plate, and I was walking down a small hallway, and I happened to notice and glance into a very small den. And in that den were just two people, Coke and a morbidly obese woman who was a social outcast. They're the only people in that room. These two people, Coke was looking in, leaning in and listening with such love to this woman who had been such an outcast because she recognized the imago dei in this person. The second image that I carry with me um, was at a concert that our, our church had that was down in our fellowship hall. And I got there early and Coke was there early also. And she was sitting next to not a friend, but the man in our congregation who was the most vile critic of her husband that there was. And this, with Coke leaning in, she was listening again with such love because she recognized that hurting people hurt people. And this man, even though he was a critic, bore the image of Jesus. The last uh, remembrance, the last picture that I carry uh, of, of Coke um, was one that often happened during worship. This was a large formal church. Many politicians, even presidents, came to worship at this church. And there were also homeless people who would wander in to this church in Washington, D.C. And one of those people uh, was Gracie, who had Tourette's. And she might stand up in the middle of a sermon and start spewing obscenities and being very inappropriate. But Coke would just gently turn to her and say, it's all right, Gracie. It's all right, Gracie. We love you. It's okay. And settle her down. A friend of mine does a practice that I think that we can adapt regarding this. This friend, whenever she's on a metro in Washington, D.C., she doesn't put her headphones in. She takes them out and has a practice of not listening to anything, but instead looking slowly around the metro car that she's in and silently blessing each person that she looks at, silently saying, may you know you are a valuable human being made in the image of God. Now, we can do this walking down the street, sitting on a flight, sitting in a coffee shop, but it takes intention. So our relationship with God, our relationship with others, and then last implication for this Imago Dei is our relationship with the world, our view of justice as an Imago Dei issue. The fact that we are made in the image of God is why the mistreatment of any human being in the world is so serious. This is why justice can never be separated from the gospel. It says in Genesis 9, 5, and 6, and from each human being too, I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. For in the image of God has God made mankind. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote about this. He wrote this, you see, the founding fathers were influenced by the Bible. The concept of the imago dei, image of God, is the idea that all men have something within them that God injected. And this gives everyone a uniqueness, a worth, a dignity, and we must never forget this as a nation. There are no gradations in the image of God. God made us to live together as brothers and sisters and to respect the dignity and worth of every human. Now we all know Desmond Tutu, who died recently, is known around the world as a religious and political leader. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his leadership in the ending of apartheid. During most of Desmond Tutu's life, laws in South Africa segregated people according to their race. Life was much more difficult for those who weren't white. 
And Desmond Tutu was beaten and put in prison simply because of the color of his skin. But when he was a young boy out walking with his mother one day, he was surprised to see a white man, a priest, take off his hat as a sign of respect to his mother, a black woman. And that incident made a profound impression on Tutu, teaching him that he didn't need to accept discrimination and that religion could be a powerful tool for advancing racial equality. No human being should ever be used or abused because they are made in the image of God. The Imago Dei is at the root of every issue of injustice. We are made in the image of God and so have dignity and worth. Sex trafficking is an Imago Dei issue. Slavery is an Imago Dei issue. Pornography is an Imago Dei issue. So, three important relationships are impacted by the truth that we are made in the image of God. Our relationship with God, with others, and with the world. But there's a problem, right? We're made in the image of God, but that image has been broken and distorted by sin. We may think of others, boy, I don't see much of Jesus in that person, right? The only perfect picture we have of the image of God is Jesus. The Bible says Jesus is, quote, the exact likeness of God, the visible image of the invisible God, and the exact representation of his being. So here's a challenge for us. We're created in the image of God, but it's distorted in us through sin and needs restoration. I want to show you something that I got last year that may be the best and the worst purchase I've ever made. It is a lighted magnifying mirror. Yeah. I have a love-hate relationship with this mirror. I'm tempted to hide it away and live in blissful, blotchy, age-spotted ignorance. It is only by looking into it, though, that I can see what's wrong and correct it. But oh, the pain of confronting all that is unattractive. Yikes, right? Now, I could have bought this mirror and just put it on a high shelf and never looked into it because, frankly, it's uncomfortable. It makes me tr face the truth about myself. But it would also mean that I would never change, never address my many imperfections. So, you and I need to ask ourselves, how committed are you to spiritual self-awareness? You have to look at Jesus if you want to see the glory of God and be transformed. 2 Corinthians 3.18 is a verse I love. It says, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. So here's an example. The other day, I looked into the mirror of God's word and part of my reading included a situation where Jesus was angry at hard-heartedness and injustice, and he did something risky in response. Now, I was convicted that I may be passionate and get angry about injustice. I may even post something on social media about it. But how often am I willing to sacrifice my comfort and do something even risky? I looked at the glory of Jesus and saw how, how far I fall short. Now, I want to make this clear. This is not an exercise in shaming. Conviction of sin says, I did something wrong. Shame says, I am something wrong. You are precious and valuable because you are made in God's image, even when evidence of your brokenness shows up. When you're convicted, you see something in yourself out of line with God's character and can be forgiven and restored, not shamed. Our job isn't just to cover up with makeup and do some image management, but we bring all of our sin before God and say, forgive me, please, and restore your image in me. And this is possible through the work of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. So what about you? What are you seeing in the mirror? What if you truly believed God's delight in you as someone made in his image? What if you recognize the same dignity and value in others? How are you being transformed? I want to suggest a practice for this week to apply the truth of 2 Corinthians 3.18, this idea of looking into the mirror of God's word to see ourselves and more clearly, and see ourselves more clearly in relationship to it. 
to become more accurately a reflection of God's image. So I'm going to suggest reading Luke 9, 10 through 16 each day, Monday through Friday. This is a familiar passage, super familiar, but I chose it for us so that we would look at Jesus in the Bible in order to see what the perfect image of God looks like. And as you read, I would suggest that you make three lists. Ask, what does this show me about God? What does this show me about myself? And what might I pray in response to what I see? I'd like to close by reading part of a blessing written by Jessica Ritchie and then pray for us. Blessed are we who turn our gaze to seek the one who truly sees us and knows us as newborns whose bleary sight focuses to find adoring eyes beaming down, delighting and filling, mirroring and multiplying. Lord, may we walk into this week strengthened by the truth that we have value, dignity, and worth because we are fearfully and wonderfully made in your image. May we have eyes to see that same value in others and treat them with respect, looking for the imago dei in each. May we all, with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, be gradually changed into your perfect likeness. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, thanks again for joining us today. And we hope that you have been blessed by this message about your worth and value, that you are the Imago Dei, the image created in the image of God. And I don't know about you, but sometimes uh, that message gets lost. You know, God is described in scripture in many places as our deliverer. He delivers us from sin and from darkness, but he also delivers us from those messages that aren't true. Uh, those lies that come into our heart that tell us we're not worthy. We're not worth anything, that God doesn't care, that we uh, don't matter. And so hear these words from Psalm 139. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. That God knows where you are at any moment. That he searches your heart and knows every thought and still loves you and gave his life for you. You matter. You have worth. You are the Imago Dei. May the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, the power and presence of the Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. And see you next week.